The lift mechanism in your robot isn't just a component. It's often key to unlocking its full potential. And picking the wrong one can sink your entire design. But if you understand the core differences between common types of bar lifts, you can design smarter, build faster, and achieve way more through robot. I'm Brogan Pratt, and with over 10 years as a robotics design and technology educator, I've seen firsthand how crucial the right lift selection is. So in this video, I'm going to run you through the essential concepts of a two bar, a four bar, and a virtual four bar lift. We'll look at some real robot examples, and I'll explain precisely how each type functions. And critically, I'll break down the pros and cons so you can confidently choose the best lift for your next project. If you use Lego Technic to describe this, you could think of this as the arm that's on top of the robot, and this is the actual arm that's rotating around. This would be a simple two-bar lift. You have one bar that's attached to the robot, and one bar that's actually rotating the object. Now imagine this green piece here is my claw. And if my claw stays in the same position, as I rotate this arm, you'll notice that the green gripper arm changes its angle as that rotation moves through. This is called a two bar lift because we have a simple arm here and a simple arm here to make two bars of your arm. And when I drive this, I can have it come up and come down as a very simple lifting mechanism. Why you might want to use a simple two bar lift, well one is super fast to get it up and going. Uh, all you need is a simple motor. You can even use a DC motor here. In fact, if you want to go a little bit faster, I'd recommend you. You probably do use a DC motor. It's going to be a little bit reliable. But you can see that a servo is actually pretty quick for getting this up and going. Uh, another reason why this is beneficial is you've got a lot of this transfer of uh, force here. So you can extend something really, really far. So right now, I can actually get this up quite high to be able to reach up. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I can actually get pretty darn high up off the floor just with a simple arm here. Uh, and that's what this force transfer does. If I were to take this arm and slap it right onto the servo, I wouldn't be able to get near as high. In fact, I'd lose quite a bit of my height. So using that force transfer allows me to get a little bit further. Another option is if I were to take a simple claw here, again, nothing fancy on this claw, but if I were to mount it on this side and as I go up, it is going to be non-parallel to the floor. So as this thing rotates, you'll notice that my claw is also going to rotate. So if you need to place something on an angled piece, actually using a two bar lift might be pretty useful. However, if we're trying to pick something up off the ground and place it at the same angle that we picked it up at, you can imagine a forklift. We actually want to be able to have this green arm rotate and stay parallel to the ground as we start. To solve that problem, engineers often turn to a standard four bar lift. So here, a four bar lift is essentially a parallelogram. You have two parallel bars here and two parallel bars here. And as I lift and rotate that one arm around these two joints, you'll notice that all two bars, each set of bar stays parallel to each other. You can also pivot it this way, where you'll notice that each set stays parallel to each other. So you've got your base, you have your two arms that pivot from that base, and then that fourth link is the coupler, and that connects the ends of these two arms together. And because it is a parallelogram, as that lifts moves with that coupler link, where that grip would be attached, it stays parallel to the base. So here in our chassis, we've got our four bar lift. In the universe system, we've got some little squishy wheels. So we can grab our piece, pick it up. And we can kind of lift it as if it were a claw. Now, just like on our small system, we have two parallel bars. we have got one parallel bar here and here. Even though this side is thinner, it is still a parallel bar system. And I have two parallel bar systems here. So as I move this list, you can see that this intake here, this little gripper, stays perfectly level or parallel. So if I were to pick something up, it's going to stay in that exact same orientation as I raise and as I lower it. It's really important in robotics because you can think of something like a forklift. You wouldn't want to lift something up and for it to change its angle as it were picking up as if it were in that two bar. You have to be able to lay something back flat as a server might carry you a drink to your tray or you might uh, go put something away on a shelf. You may also need to keep your sensors aimed correctly, whatever have you. One thing to know about this whole bar as well is that as power goes through this gear system, through this sprocket into this sprocket, this section of the four bar lift here is powered, but the other side is simply running on an idler. It's not actually receiving any power instead. Instead, our coupler here 
is the one that's actually keeping these two bars moving together. So as this sprocket here rotates this arm that is clamped down, it pulls on the coupler. This then pulls on this arm, which then rotates at this back joint here in order for our arm to actually lift itself all the way up and all the way down. So some main reason you choose a four bar lift like this, obviously the first one is that constant orientation. You want to be able to have that piece moving at the moving in the same line all the time. It keeps that end effector stable and it keeps it predictable. If you're trying to stack things on, it makes it a lot uh, simpler to be able to stack things up. You also have a controlled path. Uh, you have a much wider arc than you do with a two bar lift, as we showed earlier. But one of the big things is it's a little bit more complex to design than a simple two bar. You've got more pivoting points. You've got more things that couldn't work. Another big downside of four bar lift, it's got a lot of weight. The longer that your arm gets, the heavier that your far. And that makes it a little bit more challenging to design something around when you have something that's such a heavy lift. Like for instance, this lift here, when it's at its maximum weight, it can, if I were to give it a little bit of a tap, it can't support its own weight very well at all. A four bar lift is fantastic for keeping things level, but a big downside of a four bar lift is that it can get really bulky really fast. You've got extra links taking up a lot of that physical space. And in Technic, it doesn't add a lot of weight, but if you were to use steel or aluminum or wood or acetyl or polycarb, you'd really start to add up a lot of extra weight and it can potentially limit where you can even reach to. Another thing about having that second arm here is you'll notice that eventually the arms will hit into each other. So it does limit your reach in how far these arms are placed apart from each other at the start and the finish of that unit. So how do you get that same parallel motion as that standard four bar, but making it a lot more compact and most of the time lighter? And the answer lies in replacing one of those physical links, one of those arms with a virtual one. And in this case, I've created a virtual arm here with a pulley and some with a belt and some pulleys, but you could also do this with some sprockets and some chain. Both would be acceptable. So as I lift this up, you'll notice that the arm stays parallel. That end effector, our gripper, stays parallel with where our system is. So how does that actually work? So on our system, we have our main lift arm here. So I have two on these side, but you can effectively think of this like one arm. These are made of some acetyl plates. You could also make them out of aluminum, whatever it is you have. At the end of our arm, we've got our gripper on this pulley. And this is the gripper that has to be able to stay level as we lift up and down. So we need to ensure in order for this gripper to stay level or parallel to the ground, we have to ensure that this whole end effector assembly counter rotates relative to the main arm. So as this main arm rotates up, we need to make sure that this end point is counter rotating against that other arm. Otherwise we would end up changing the angle of that gripper as we move up and down. Now this is where that belt and pulley or chain and sprocket system comes in. You can see that on our system, we have two pulleys here. One pulley back at the main arm of the system and a second pulley back here at the end effector. Now the important thing about these pulleys is that the back of my arm here, this axle here, is solid. It is directly tied in to the machine here. So as I rotate, you'll notice that this axle here does not pivot. And this pulley is directly constrained to this axle here. So as I rotate this arm, you'll notice that this pulley does not rotate. The gear on the outside and the arm itself rotates, but the pulley itself is not rotating. On the front end of our system here, we've got the other end of the pulley the pulley does rotate along with it. So let's give that little rotation here. You notice that as I rotate up, that pulley is changing angles with that system. So it, I am free to rotate this pulley and this bar system. Key point here to notice about a standard virtual four bar is that the pulley here on this main arm is not directly on the pivoting axle of that main lift arm here. So if we look in close at this system, so if we're looking in at this system here, this gear and this 
acetyl arm is on a ball bearing. So it's able to rotate around this axle, but it's not actually physically attached to this bearing here. So this whole arm rotates on these joints, and we can see that movement here. So this whole arm rotates here, and on the assembly side where our gear is, this pulley here rotates independently of this arm. So this whole subassembly here is attached via a ball bearing to this lift arm here. So while the lift arm here is pivoting and the pulley is attached here, the pulley is free and the lift arm, or sorry, the lift arm itself is free and the pulley itself is rotating. So it's actually the opposite. While the pulley is constrained, the pulley is unconstrained. While the arm is unconstrained, the arm itself is constrained. And that's how we end up getting that kind of virtual four bar with these pulley systems. Here's that main idea. As this main arm here rotates, the belt forces that gripper pulley to rotate. And if these pulleys are the same size, which these ones are, they're both a one-to-one, -one, the gripper is going to rotate by the same amount as that main arm does, but in the opposite direction relative to that arm itself. So that counter rotation, as this is rotating up this way, this is rotating the opposite direction, is what keeps that gripper level to the ground, or more accurately, keeps it parallel to its starting orientation. So as we can see that as that arm goes up, that gripper stays perfectly level to the ground the whole time. Let's show you a better angle here with something actually attached. So we can see that as we start with this cube in place, the cube stays at the same angle throughout the entire range of motion through this system. If you were to say, take this back pulley and make it smaller than this front pulley, you would actually end up slowly changing the angle of your arm over time. And you may find that beneficial depending on what your robot's goals are. To think of it as a, another example, you can think of it as you've got one standard bar here in your four bar. This second bar here is that tension that used to be in the system with that two arms. This belt is now providing that second arm, but it's running over two pulleys. Why might you want to use a virtual four bar uh, as opposed to a standard four bar? Well, it's a lot more compact. Using a, a standard four bar, we'd have to have an additional arm here and that saves up a lot of space. It also allows us to rotate all the way around. So right now I'm being constrained by my gripper hitting this bar. But if that bar were not there, I could actually rotate all the way around. And then I could have effectively 360 degrees of motion if nothing else were in the way. Belts and pulleys tend to be a little bit lighter than some of those solid metal links. Uh, and you, when you set this up, you get some really nice, smooth motion that keeps things consistently parallel. And sometimes having this a lot more compact really helps things uh, get a little more rigid. It also helps things be a little bit easier to put together as opposed to having to find places to put an additional four bar. So some challenges here. Belt tension is key. Uh, some people use a pinch test. Some people use a turn test. I like to use a turn test. You should be able to get to about 90 degrees without much tension, but if, and it should be a little bit harder to get it to flip all the way over. In fact, you probably shouldn't be able to flip it all the way over. So this belt's probably a little bit loose. Uh, if it's too tight, you're going to increase that friction on your motor and it's going to be too hard. If it's too loose, you'll probably end up slipping a tooth. Another thing that's challenging about this is you have to be able to get your lengths uh, proper for your belt length. Belts come in pretty standard lengths. Um, and there are some calculators online. I'll leave a link down below so you can figure out what your proper length should be. But adding in a little tensioner or a little idler at the end of the day can always help with some of these problems if you do happen to not get it right from the start. So the virtual four bar is a really clever way to get that parallel lifting motion. It uses that pulley system. This pull is constrained. This pull is free. This arm is constrained. This arm is free to be able to create that four bar lift in a much more compact system. Being able to understand those different lifting mechanisms, the two bar, traditional four bar, and a virtual four bar gives you more options when you're designing your robot. Each of them has their own place. It's not like a two bar, four bar, virtual four bar are good or bad. They have their purposes. So the virtual four bar with a pulley driven or a sprocket and chain is a fantastic choice for lots of applications where you need to keep that end effector parallel to the ground. 
as well. It's also fantastic when you keep things nice and light. If you found value in this video and it helps you understand those virtual four bar lifts a little bit better, please hit that like button and consider subscribing for more robotics, programming, and design tutorials. It really does help the channel reach more people like you. Thanks for watching and best of luck in your next robotics project.